Welcome everyone. And let me pass it over to Carolina. Good morning. I wanted to open this session today. We will have a proper presentation, but I just, I really wanted to share my story because for me, I think the, the GRC, I had arrived at the GRC maybe a couple of months back when I met Adam and Miki-san on this call. And I heard this name. Hello, Miki-san. Welcome. I had heard about, start hearing about this project, this idea, when I'm staying though, and there was this whole line of how, and just for a little bit of context, project is located in Kumano, which is a beautiful, very spiritual area, very old area of Japan that has these pilgrimage trails that are world heritage called the Kumano Kodo, which means literally the Kumano old road. The people have been walking for thousands of years. And then I hear about this project and the idea of Kumano Shindo and how a small detour from the Kumano old road could show people the road to a new future that is more regenerative for everyone. And this was really, it sounded really beautiful to me. And then I heard about these other projects that were associated like the Helio Compass, a calendar that everyone can see at all time, the entire year with all of the planets around. There was the, the whole Eno network, a competition to help people find their, to help fund disruptive innovation projects around the world from the government of Japan. And it was all tied back to Manoshindo. And at the time, there were, the activities were still starting. And I heard about this new event that had happened that had brought Juda Judaism to Japan and to bring a connection between Judaism and Shintoism in Japan. There were people joining digitally, people sent messages from around the world, and people in Japan were able to interact with it on the land that the project is in. So all of these ideas seemed really new to me. Um, everything seemed really interesting. And I started talking regularly with Adam here. And at the time I was also, I learned that there was a piece of land and no one with the house on it that needed a lot of repair. And no one was really sure what was going to happen then. And I've always been passionate about permaculture and I've done a lot of smaller things, a lot of volunteering, a lot of smaller garden. And I was looking for the opportunity to do something larger scale, more like a master plan for a piece of land that was sizable. And I thought, well, I'm going to kind of jump at this and try to grab this opportunity. And I offered Adam, well, if you send me some maps and some images, why don't I try to make a permaculture design for this land? And fortunately, the team was as excited as I was. And I received everything. I, I did this plan and everyone was so excited about it that as soon as the government of Japan opened the borders, even just a tiny bit for business visas, the team found a way to pull me through to Japan to start working on the project there. I spent four months there last year implementing and actually experiencing Kumano uh, firsthand. It's a place like no other, honestly. I really miss it. It's mountains by the sea, lovely people, lovely food, lovely scenery. I love all of it. And then... I also, I, I really, I really want to go back there and we just got started. So we did some small things, we did some small events, but I think it was really important. We really activated and connected with the community. I met all of the neighbors. We did some events with schools and kids. And this year, everything is kicking off. The, the house built is ongoing. It's being renovated. And I do want to... Working with this team has been amazing in general, and I do have to take my hat off to add them because I will say that in Japan, things of this kind are not easy. There's a lot of bureaucracy, and they are a little bit more resistant toward people that have immigrated or are foreigners, and Adam is still throughout all of this, and while holding like a full-time job and taking care of a family of four, managed to pull this project completely and take it to a whole new level so i think this is this has been like a beautiful project to be a part of and i would like to thank everyone and thank adam especially and hand, actually hand the word over to you adam you are definitely the best person to talk about the vision for the project thank you very much carolina thank you andrew i'm going to share my screen one moment please 
And the presentation today doesn't follow a kind of a strong line, a logical line. So if you have any questions or how things kind of get put together, let please let me know. And in the future, I'd be happy to share some materials as well. So if you can see my screen here, yes? Yes, I see it. So right now, my name is Adam Lobel. I'm representative director at Kumano Shindo General Incorporated Association. I'm here with the fellow directors, Miki Koji, and also Carolina. Thank you. And the kind of where this has kind of at least taken the most traction so far is an education for low carbon society, as well as early childhood education and this aspect of innovation. And I'll be talking about kind of the origin story of the project, as well as what we're working on currently. So this is October 2020. Excuse me. And the. This is the moment where the term Kumano Shindo kind of came to being, but it's important to also understand how this moment happened because this wasn't such an easy moment to get to either. So in April 2020, I live with my father-in-law and he receives a letter that I happen to see from the city hall in Kumano City that a house and property are in major disrepair. And I said to him, what is this? I I'd been married at that point for maybe 13 years, 12, 13 years. And he said, I'm just getting rid of this. Don't worry about it. And I said, I'm going down. Please don't get rid of it. And I drove down about a seven and a half, eight hour drive with my friend, Nathan. We went to the same language school, two years separated in Yokohama, the Institute for Interuniversity Center for Japanese Language Studies. And we lived in the same town and we've been staying friends for 15 years now. So we drove down there. And we found, I'll show you a photo later, kind of a house in major disrepair. And I just wandered the community. I kind of pick up this skill from my father, who is a land use attorney in New York and works with a lot of community boards. He's 86. He still works four days a week. And it's not transactional as much as it's kind of getting permission for buildings to be built as out of as of right in New York City, which involves a lot of community work. So I'm walking and I see a carpenter and I say, I, I go, there's this, at this point, the house, I just saw it. It's completely covered with, with plant, plant life. I said, I need your help to bring this, to bring this building back, you know, to restore it. And he introduces me to Kawamura sensei. I go back, I go in June, 2020. I go back in August, 2020 with my father-in-law. So the people in the community see I have credentials. I then go in October 2020 and meet Kawamura sensei and he starts to do some surveys and he said this is a long piece of land juxtaposed by the ancient Kumano Kodo old trail that Carolina said why don't we call it Kumano Shindo which means Kumano new trail kind of as a detour where tourists can kind of go off the path of the the well worn path of the Kumano Kodo and see like a new vision for Kumano and I, I really stuck this is Tanaka-san. She is working for the city. She just finished her contract. She has a, a degree in education from University of Tokyo. She was an early supporter of the project. And this is Kawamura Sensei. And this is a little bit of what the, how the project has evolved. This is in 2020 in June. This is Nathan. This is the, this is the house. And this is the same view of the house in October. So we'd been there in sorry, in, in December. So we'd been there in June, August, October, and December. So in four times, in two or three, two or three work days each, we just toil, cut down the bamboo. And this is the same exact view here after only four visits and really just working hard. This view on the bottom of the project is when we first came again, same day in June, 2020. 2020. And this is the new roof on our project in May of this year. So you can really see how this project has evolved. Uh, we're currently doing a crowdfunding campaign and we built up like amazing support among stakeholders in the community. In particular, I wanted to give my thanks to Professor Tada, Dr. Tada, 
who did finish just recently a PhD in the subject of, I want to say ancient shrines or ancient shrine culture in the Kumano region. His architectural office is in Kyoto. He's done several restoration projects in Kumano, and he teaches two days a week at Kinki University, Kindai University in Osaka. And th these are the students. This is Professor Sano, who is sort of seminar the students belong to. This is Prof This is Dr. Abe Sensei, another architect in his, I don't speak French, but atelier. And the rest are students. And then Nonaka Carpenter Group. These are part of Nonaka-san's team. And Nonaka-san actually had to travel about 30, 40 minutes from Shingu. But because Dr. Tada was very comfortable with this project team, he wanted to know Nakasan to be involved, and it's been proven to be very a uh, great kind of boon for the project. And this is last Friday, so we're now doing construction on the walls. We finished the roof, and there'll be it's kind of L shape and L shaped. So the south face and the uh, east face, which are kind of the more uh, public facing sides, will be covered with wood that will be donated or procured at a low price from our local partner nojimoku who just nojinoku nojimoku nobutaka is a third generation he just became president of his timber company in may and he's been a big supporter of our project and these are again kinky university students and amy who carolina knows who has a master's in ocean science from Ryukyu university and lives 40 minutes away and is now heading up our early childhood education so we've been really kind of organically building our network and we are really grateful for connecting with these wonderful people. And this is, unfortunately, there was kind of typhoon conditions last Sunday, so we had to cancel the class, but Amy came with her daughter, Hazel, and we did a run through of our first kind of early childhood education class on building hotels for, and watering places for insects, as well as kind of planting in the herb garden. This is from construction. This is Todd Van Horn, who has a similar kind of regenerative project in Wakayama Prefecture, which is bordering on Kumano, <clears throat> sorry, Mie Prefecture. And he's been living in Wakayama for, I guess, almost 20 years. He was on the JET program, the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program, which was started in the 80s, started with four countries, I believe, US, England, Australia, and Canada, or New Zealand and Canada, and is now up to about 50 different countries with approximately 80,000 alumni. These are young people who, after college, go to local regions in Japan to encourage internationalization and language study. And Todd stayed, and he's been a great partner of the project. So connecting with Todd and other JET alumni has been a priority, and now we're actually being featured this month in the JET Alumni Association kind of newsletter or news blast. So we've been connecting on that front. We've been connecting with JET alumni who are restoring Japanese homes all over Japan, and we'll be doing a podcast later this month. And we're actually talking about a new upcycle program where a third of homes by 2040 in Japan are going to be abandoned. This is an, called Akio. And how can some of these materials be upcycled into smaller kind of mini homes for maybe foreigners or Japanese people who want the ambience of an old style home, but maybe can't afford or don't want to take care of a larger home? This is joining Todd's programming in his program called Camp Kumano in Tanabe in Wakayama Prefecture, also near the Kumano Kodo. And just a little bit about the history of Kumano. The area used to be called Kinokuni, which is the land of the trees. So it's kind of a beautiful, historically, like a very regenerative, you know, vibe to it. This is the peninsula you can see here. It used to be called Kishu or Kinokuni. So before it became the modern Mie and Wakayama prefectures, this was one kingdom. And it's home to this UNESCO sacred sites and pilgrimage routes in the Key Mountain Range, one of two um, pilgrimage, only two pilgrimage routes that are re registered UNESCO World Heritage Sites. The second is called Wa Carolina. The, the what? Con which one? Sorry, can you say that again? The one in Portugal and France and Spain. Oh, it's Camino de Santiago or yes. the Way of St. James is considered yes. in English. And you can see, though, Carolina knows this a little bit better than mine. The most of these trails are actually in Wakayama Prefecture. There are three main shrines that kind of form the juxt of these, including maybe Miki-san can give me a little bit of insight in 
Kobadaishi or Kukai, and maybe the role of Kukai in, in Kumano. Miki-san, are you familiar with the, the story of Kukai and Kumano? Yeah, You're Kukai muted. is one of the famous uh, monks in Japan, and he established a special Buddhism called Mikyo, and he created a Buddhism wisdom, a wisdom kingdom in this area. And many people, many Japanese people go to this area because some people really want to experience spiritual experience in this area. And there, there are so many, so much, many mountains and shrines and temples. So this is, this area is the one of the spiritual spot in Japan. Thank you so much. And most of these trails are in Wakayama. This purple trail here is the one that passes through Kumano City on the Mie Prefecture side along the coast. You can see this is Kumano Shindo here in Japanese. This goes to Issei. It actually is the trail to the Grand Shrine in Issei. This is the trail that the emperor traveled historically to travel from Issei to Kumano Kodo, to the, to the shrines, the three shrines. So it's like a, it's a significant historical area. And these are just some notes about it. I'll just read this briefly. So Kinokuni was an administrative district in classic Japan, sometimes called Kinokuni, which means a country where the gods of trees dwell. It's been mentioned in the Nihon Shoki, which is one of the earliest written histories of Japan. Here it says that Itakeru no Mikoto, the son of Susa no Mikoto, was ordered by his sister deities, Oyatsuhime and Tsumatsuhime, to plant trees all over the country. Uh, he recognized the area of modern-day Wakayama Prefecture as a good place and decided to live there. It was When it was first established in the 17th century, it was called Kinokuni, and may have been written using Chinese characters for ki, which means tree itself. This is a different character, meaning also pronounced ki. And it may have been derived from the appearance of abundant rainfall. So the city just north of Kumano City, Owase, has the highest amount of rainfall uh, in Japan. Established in the 7th century, Ki Prevents has long history and was previously known as the Yamato Kingdom, which was based in Nara Basin. The Kojiki states the records of ancient in the ancient Samaritan Mess states Emperor Jinmu passed through Ki Kumano when he entered Yamato. So he had some failures in taking over Japan. He went to the east coast of Kishu. He followed a three legged crow, Rasu, and this three legged crow took. Jinmu Tenno, the first emperor of Japan to conquer Yamato and then unite kind of Japan is the long story short. The book that became popular that Carolina is referring to is kind of, I'm not familiar on the details, but talks about ancient Jewish presence in this and other regions of Japan, including in Shikoku. And there is some evidence that the Silk Road did not end on the east coast of China. But rather, the Silk Coast really ended, the Silk Road ended in Japan. I can't go into the details now, but this book became a bestseller in Japan, and the people in Kumano also were interested in it. So they were kind of interested in me, an Eastern European Jew. Just touching briefly, Andrew, do I have like another five minutes or so? Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, pl five, sir. Plenty of time, Adam. Take your time. Okay. Keep going. Thank you. So I just wanted to kind of talk about, this is some materials that were lent to me. These can't be shared, but they're kind of part of a game that's been developed to regenerate and rejuvenate the forestry sector in Kumano. And I have like a 200 slide presentation, which I'm going to be putting into English. It's super interesting, but it's important to know that this is like a major industry here. One recent beautiful contribution is I've been connecting a project from my nonprofit research institute where I've been a researcher since 2008, called the Institute for Future Engineering, which does a lot of project work for government of Japan, um, clients like the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, the Cabinet Office. They were creating, they've created a consortium to understand the carbon sequestration ability of trees and to evaluate trees using IoT from the rhizome level to the canopy level in order to measure things like CO2, water, chemicals, and biodiversity. And to this is starting now through some interesting introductions, which I've helped facilitate between my research lab and now Nojimoku, who is pictured in this photo. So now they're going to be implementing some of this IoT 
and low carbon forestry into Kumano, which is like super exciting. I'm doing a meeting tomorrow to kind of talk about their formal entrance into the consortium. So a lot of like cross-pollination things that I learned in the GRC are really happening in Kumano right now. This is part of a game. Like there's, it's a really interesting game and it's like teaching young people about how to evaluate the quality of lumber. It's really interesting. I won't, I don't know enough about it, but suffice to say that the quality of the lumber and the way that it's felled and grown in Japan is quite unique. And J this area of Japan is known for its very high quality cypress and cedar. Just a little bit about myself and how I got interested in environmental matters, then we happy to take a break. I'm from Great Neck, New York. I grew up on the North Shore of Long Island, which is an island that was formed through glacial, glacial activity. It used to be home to Native Americans. I didn't understand why people weren't swimming in the Long Island Sound. But in fourth grade, an environmental educator came into my class with a mini aquifer showing different, seg different sediment levels, poured dirty water through the mini aquifer, it got cleaned, poured printer's ink into the aquifer, the ink plumed, then poured the dirty water through the aquifer again, and all that ink was pulled into the water. And I could see that pollution has major ramifications on our drinking water and soil. And it was like a light bulb went off. Started to take classes at CW Post. I took classes in college. I went on to do a master's degree in Japan in restoration of traditional agricultural landscape. I've been interested in distributed communication technology and how we can deploy the right people across the world to solve problems and worked with my former partner, Dan Marmar, to patent a technology uh, last year, or it finally was patented last year. And I was, I received an award from the ministry, government of Japan, ministry of the communication, uh, so Michelle. Sorry, I don't know the English right now. Internal Affairs and Communication, their innovation program. And this is a program where basically the government of Japan feels that really crazy wild ideas are the ones that are going to kind of help change the world. And I won the award with my company, Sazung, in 2019 for this digital technology. And when I came to Kumano, like a few months after I saw this beat up house, I said, I want to create an innovation center here. And this innovation program was gracious enough to allow us to become one of their network network hubs in 2020. And we've been recruiting people who wanted to also apply for the program. And another important kind of moment in my life was thanks to Mickey-san, who came early to Kumano, I think October or December of 2020, and started to work on the land, was taking his Zen school, which taught me that really all I needed to innovate and find happiness was inside myself. We've later translated the curriculum into English and are looking forward to teaching those classes, both online with people interested in the States and Europe and Africa, et cetera, as well as people who want to come to Japan. And this is kind of the core juxt of the Zen school, which is, you know, realize, realizing what you don't know what you want. This is the 10 ox pattern. It's a, you know, classic series of 10 pictures representing the path towards Zen enlightenment. And it kind of is a encapsulates my own transformation through Kumano Shindo. I'm happy to share these later. Just going to take a few more minutes and then take some questions. The GRC was my experience, my first exposure to the concept of regeneration. De David Hodgson, I've known him for many years, since probably like 2015, when I was talking about and working on the topic of communication at Sazong. I met many wonderful people here at GRC. I understood how it, you know, the, the evolution of beyond sustainability towards regeneration and felt intuitively at home in the GRC and also that the concepts of regeneration were very much a good fit for Kumano. And I felt one of the reasons for that is there's an ancient world word called musuhi, which means to kind of fuse two not, not normally fused ideas or concepts into a new idea. And uh, there's the old and the new, there's the foreign and the native, there's the kind of the regenerative and traditional, maybe non-regenerative practices. I feel that this is like a, Kumano is a great place to really create a lot of traction 
for the regenerative movement. And I brought this concept of regeneration into our articles of incorporation, which are stated in our charter. We incorporated in June of 2021 as a formal organization. And the mission is to accelerate our transition to Kumano Shindo's mission is to accelerate our transition to a regenerative society where people have a sense of excitement. We collaborate in our place and around the world to create projects and learning opportunities with new value using modern technologies and respecting nature and the wisdom of our ancestors. And I feel like we have been honest and true to those concepts and that mission. Kind of just wanted to give my thanks to the team. There've been many, many people along the way, including our an early, you know, earlier director who left the company, Inoue Emi-san helped found the company. Mizu helped, still works on our projects. And I just wanted to also say thank you to Yuki Watanabe, who's been coming to Kumano early, and also Dan Bin and I have been working recently on our first major revenue opportunity for the company. And that's in creating materials on low carbon society, the Paris Agreement, carbon neutrality, and now the IPCC AR6 working groups one, two, and three into interesting online English educational courses for Japanese students and people in continuing education to learn more about the environment. Uh, Mia University has sponsored this project and has also allowed us to interview leading climate scientists in Japan who are working on the various working groups who've been generous with their time and we've created like a really unique body of work in English. One of the other reasons for creating this body of online education is to encourage wonderful students overseas who may be interested in joining the Japanese research ecosystem to come to Japan and join the story here. So it's a also adds to the diversity of the research community and of Japan. And I'm very optimistic with the help of my colleagues here and also my colleagues at the university, the project colleagues and the renovation, the citizens of Kumano City, including Nojimoko and many other local citizens, groups and organizations, that this project will succeed, that its ripple effects will go far and wide. And with everyone's help today, we can continue to cross pollinate and do really great work together. I think that this is enough from on my end. There's a lot more slides and everything else, but I'll just leave and say thank you at this point and say thank you very much. Andrew, I'll turn it over to you and Carolina. Adam, that's super inspiring for me. I'm actually curious also, since we have Mickey-san and Carolina, whether you wanted to add anything to what Adam was saying, and then we could just take comments and questions from everyone else. But do either of you have anything to add? Right now, I'd just like to th thank Adam for this. The way he presents the project is always very personal. It's always it's always different, always new. To whoever wants to make questions, comments, feedback, and very welcome. Yeah, anything. Just we're a cozy group, so I think that that will work well. Well, I'd love to know a bit more about the restoration process and how this. I'm an architect, so <laughs> I'm always interested in that. If you have any words on the topic. Yeah. yeah. And about your approach to a, a restoration of an historical building. So the, I will share the, the screen from the crowdfunding site because it provides some interesting back data. So this is the house, what it looked like when I first got there. And this is my great grandfather-in-law, Fujito, who was the first principal of an all girls high school in the area, which still exists a hundred years later as a, it's, 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 it's joined two other schools as a me prefectural public high school, Kinomoto high school. And the, the original floor plan was kind of elucidated by Kawamura sensei who did a survey and on the, I don't know if I can like. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. So this is a one story kind of farmhouse in very bad. It was in very, very bad condition. It has kind of a loft as well, which is, has a lot of space, but it was not accessible. They, there was an addition made in the 1950s. This is the old house here. 
built about 100 years ago, and then a newer addition here. Interestingly, the newer addition suffered from termite damage and more damage, which leads me to believe that actually the older carpentry and materials in the older part of the house were of a higher quality. This material here was made during Japan's major economic expansion after the war, where materials were probably more mass produced and there was less kind of craftsmanship done into it. When I spoke with Kamura Sensei, he initially said that this entire addition would have to be raised because of termite damage. And then when Professor Tada Sensei, who I met through just for personal connections, looked at it, he said that it was fine. But we late, he later found out when we took off the ceiling and roof parts that it wasn't that fine. So there's been some evolution of the project. And this is when, the pro, when he said that this area was fine. He put together this kind of cool 3D model. So this is the older section. And he actually put translucent material here so that sunlight could go through and that people could access this loft area. And really the decisions that went into making what, did, what kind of thinking went into making these, the design decisions was his experience with restoring farmhouses, what amenities were needed. So there was no bathroom in the house. Traditionally, there was an outhouse, but there will now be a toilet in the house, which makes it much easier for us to do work. But we didn't use traditional materials. So like the original roof had over 2,300 tiles. But installing tile roofs is very expensive. So we went with like a corrugated metal material, which I initially was like kind of balked at, but I realized that we needed to get this project going and that there were going to be certain trade-offs. And being able to use the house as soon as possible was very important. No one was living there full time, but it would be kind of a fort for us to live in when we were working on the land. We could have seminars there. And this area... Originally, was he was going to extend it all the way out here. There was termite damage, so he was going to cut it in half. But they've been able to re-strengthen up the materials where actually they're going to just only take out the walls of a small section. And one of the reasons for that actually is because taking off demolition work, this house is in an island of land. There's no road access. Everything has to be heave-hoed to like a small truck, which has to be driven down to a big truck. So they actually said, let's just strengthen the materials, not do demolition. But there actually is going to be like this nice area where people can kind of put their feet outside. There's going to be like a little outside veranda kind of area. And I have a video I can share later. So a lot of the design decisions were made on a low budget and out of necessity. And I'm happy to say that the roof, which was leaking and being eaten by termites. And actually, let me just go back. The roof was traditionally made tile roof with soil underneath. So tons and tons of soil are under Japanese traditional tile roofs, as well as cedar bark. So all that organic material was taken off. And then the process of putting up the new roof is on YouTube. I can share those links and you can see how everything is done. And this is kind of the... The, the metal that's been put on and then insulation will be put underneath to keep it cool during the summer actually and warmer during the winter months so that's kind of like it in a nutshell i would actually recommend if you're interested in kind of his approach towards renovation is he has a wonderful website with a lot of english language press which i can share and you can see his kind of community centric approach this is in Shingu, where the Nonaka carpenter is from. And this is a public space he built right next to a library, which is really cool. So I just wanted to kind of see like his kind of style. Just trying to think of an ex example. Like this kind of restoration style, I think is just, you know, beautiful. And you can read about it. I think he's just committed to, re to restoring in kind of, the feeling of the new and the old. I think just one thing to add, sorry, is there's two main themes for this restoration. This is called the Room of Sky and Room of Earth. So the Room of Sky is you can feel the sky. There's the skylight. You can go up to the loft. You can kind of feel the presence of what's above you. 
And then the room of earth is actually there are portions where you can actually touch the physical ground. And this is a kind of a seminar and tea ceremony space. And this is more a living and a seminar space. And this southern wall, which will have woodworking, has a view of the the sea. You can see in my kind of background has a view of the Kumano Nada or the sea. So it's a, like a beautiful integration into nature. And the only thing I would add is that Carolina has been in charge of this master plan. So how does the living space here integrate into the tea garden, the living space, food jet gardens, et cetera? And we're slowly developing these areas now, moving eastward as the project develops. So this is a very long piece of property and it feeds into the living space here. Thank you. It's lovely. And limitations breed creativity, I think. So, you know, because you're saying it has, do it, it, you have a lot of limits in your, in your project? But I think that's what brings, you know, new and beautiful solutions to a project. So all that. When, thank you. When I first met people in, in, Val, in the area, their first their first kind of response was, so we'll put an estimate together to dem demo the whole building. And I said, no, 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 no. So I, I love that. And that is maybe I can build off of that because the way that you've evolved this is it looks pretty incredible, especially when you tell the story, how piece by piece, not only of course the house, the building feels like a actually a symbol or representation of the people and the ideas, the cultural connections that you started blending together with others, which I think is fascinating because it's totally not a top down thing. It's a, it's really like, or it's so organic. And I, I'm just wondering if you can reflect a little bit about what it means to be growing organically like you are, because it's, it's not without pattern or purpose. But it's completely different than if you came in and said, well, let's just rip this thing down and we're going to, you know, it's, it's a completely different kind of logic. How is, how is, how would you reflect on that? So thank you. I've felt a strong calling to this area for many years, even before I came here. So I feel like there's almost, there's another kind of force at play. So I can't take all the credit. And of course, there've been a lot of partners. I will say that the recent crowdfunding and publicizing the project has gotten people who were initially reluctant to understand and support the project, including the wonderful elders of the community to, I, I met with them last week and they gave me their blessing, which was like a huge thing for me. And as far as not having complete control, I mean, as far as the design is concerned, like I really, like Tada Sensei has a lot of say in this and I've given like, he always will explain things, but I've also given him kind of control over the project and he'll of course confer with me, but I respect his vision. You know, I, I. I also wanted to say, I, I spoke with Mickey-san about this. I had a hard moment yesterday or the day before where a local business person was like, maybe you shouldn't have done this renovation because it's, it's costing money. Maybe you should have waited, like made this kind of a six-year plan. It's only been three years. Why are you doing this now? You're not like respecting kind of the spirit of the community. Like you should have spent more time having tea with people. And, but then we kind of chatted about it and I brought like, I kind of brought a couple of things to his attention. I'm not kind of tooting my own torn, but when I first met him, he, he had said to me that a lot of people would come into the area claiming that they wanted to do like these huge projects and many, most of them have already left. And I told him like, I've been around here for three, three years on my own dime, kind of really showing passion for the project. And then I said like, I said to him, you know, we need a, like, we need a toilet and a roof. And one of the re first reasons for going down there is we had neighbors were making claims against the property because of the damage that these tiles could have during a typhoon. The, the area experiences typhoons. 
So just long story short, Andrew, the same people who are making the, the, the claims about the property are now like letting us use their bathroom and letting us it offering to let us use a room in their house to get changed. And my neighbor lets me use his truck every time I come into town. And I think I always like if, if I make a mistake, I'll own it immediately and write a very formal letter in Japanese as an apology. And then what I'll do to make it right. Like I will not let any issue fester like for more than 12 hours, really. And actually I'd met the, my original neighbors in this project because I received a map from the city hall with my neighbor's names. And I wrote letters to all my neighbors saying this, I, I, I'm coming, I'd like to see the house. And one neighbor actually wrote back to me and that he's become a major advocate for the project. So I would just say that like getting people in the community to get involved has been huge. I would also say that or more formal, sometimes more formal organizations like the Board of Education have been harder to break through. And actually kind of the direction where we want to take things now in Japan, what we've learned is, especially among our education partners, is not to go through the kind of formal, as you mentioned, Andrew, top-down organizations, but actually look towards local partners who are doing more grassroots activity. So in Japan, the Board of Education, Monka Sho Mex, the, you know, the, the National Board of Education, Ministry of Education have strong rules. So breaking through is hard. But the Juku system in Japan is school after school. Like my son goes to Juku. People do Narai Goto in Japan, which means learning things. It could be everything from learning abacus to sports. And working with those informal partners and getting help, like there's an English school, Juku. Becoming a local Juku, we've kind of discovered is the path to our success. So Andrew, it was a long-winded answer, but informal, like kind of working with more informal organizations who've had success, I think is going to be the key and, and creating small successes in our early childhood education classes month after month will be the key to demonstrating to the local community that we're creating value. So at this point, we're still an outlier and maybe considered odd. But once we do English classes once a month and start to bring you know, interesting value generative people to the community who are committed to our project, things will slowly turn around in that five, six year horizon. Well, amazing. Thank you. Adam. I see Nikki has a question or a comment. Go ahead, Nikki. Yeah, I just wanted to say like, you know, when I came in here and we were doing the check-ins, I mentioned I'd been I'm going through a bit of a difficult time and I just want to really express my gratitude to Adam, Carolina, and Mickey for what you're doing because it's, it's really inspiring to see that it is literally regenerative in the sense that you're bringing life back to that and empowering it and, and you know, infusing it with that much commitment and dedication. And in a world right now where, you know, we're, we're so used to seeing so many artificial projects claiming to be regenerative when we know they're not, which for me as an, an autistic person, it really messes with my head and like, you know, frustrates me quite a bit. You know, when I get approached with with certain projects or whatever, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. How are you putting regenerative on this? But this is a true example of regeneration in the most respectful way. And And to hear what you just said about not letting things fester more than 12 hours and how you take accountability and how you, you know, speak to how you'll fix things and the relationship you've been able to build. I just, I'm, I can't even tell you, I, I, I've i been sitting in these presentations, like earlier I did, you know, I was in the Africa Eats presentation and I'm, I'm just so grateful for those of you on here. Like 
I, I don't know much about Joe, but I've crossed paths with the rest of you. And it gives me hope for the future when, you know, I'm really struggling. And so I want to say thank you for that. And then I wanted to just clarify the total amounts you're trying to fundraise and and how close you are to the goal. Like, where are you financially and where do you need to be financially? Thank you. I just wanted to also just add two more. Thank you, Nikki. Two more kind of very brief cross-pollination examples, which have kind of been meaningful to me recently. And that's that we always pass by this judo dojo, which is literally two doors down. And I met the father many times, but then through the construction project, wanted to use their parking lot and reached out and connected with the son who has a great Instagram account and invited me to practice at their dojo. I practice karate, but I learned some throwing and falling techniques as well. And they've been a big project supporter. And as well as my, I work, my day job is in factory automation. And my manager came down last week and to work on a potential client in Kumano. And so we've been like building up a lot more cross-pollination. And to your, to answer your question, this crowdfunding campaign, which ends in four days is 16% complete. I'm not giving up until the end. Mickey san knows that it's a high hurdle, but I will not accept defeat because if you think about defeat, you will, that's what you'll get. The total project budget that we figured to do the renovation to get it like into something really wonderful. I shared the English with Carolina, but it's about total 6.6 .6 million yen JPY to USD or about $47,000. And this crowdfunding represents mm. maybe three quarters of that. Uh, and currently the payments for construction have come out of my pocket personally, which I'm fine with right now. I guess with this project, it's been great for marketing and I met wonderful people through the community. It's been mostly Japanese, although I do have an English guide for people overseas who want to contribute. I have two videos in English, how to do it, though. It's a little hard to use the system. I'm hoping this is an all or nothing campaign. So if we don't close this money by Sunday, 11 PM, we'll get nothing. If we don't close it, I'm hoping to reach out to the supporters of this particular project and say, will you recommit? We'll make it maybe like a smaller amount, but it takes it's unlike Indiegogo, it takes two months from the end of the campaign for them to release funds. Yeah. So that's kind of the state of our fundraising. To date, the founders and I have bootstrapped the company. So I bootstrapped the company since and the operation since 2020. Mickey san as well and Carolina san have used their time, hours, and money in order to come to Kumano and work. So with this project with Mia University, it's our first revenue moment. We're very grateful for that. And then we hope we were hoping to get, and I still hope to, to successfully close out this. If our project goes viral, then hopefully we'll close it out by Sunday. Go ahead, Christiana. Well, I would like to uh, congratulate Adam for his work and just to assure him that uh, I am trying to do my fee villages, yeah. which is the regenerative village down in southern Greece. And he has inspired me so much that I think for the very second time in my professional life, I think I am into something good. And I hope that we can create also with people in this group the great connections that we need for regenerative villages and making them apply is key to the whole development and then getting people to have incomes out of these efforts is the very second big step. So Aaron, thank you for being such an inspiration. And if you need help, I'm writing you an email. Thank you very much. Chris Adam, I feel in awe of what all of you have done. So thank you. I'm curious, like, you know, in your own self-assessment, 
what would be, what would be, is there an element you wished you had more of, or you still want to address or, you know, that, that, that just feels not at the, at the level that you want or an aspiration. So it doesn't have to be a negative. I'm just curious, like, is it, it just, it sounds beautiful. I'm just curious how you think about it yourself. And like, if we could, we would do this better or differently or whatever. Yeah, that's a great question. So at the top of my head, I feel like the getting people to come and congregate in a workday, Carolina said this often, kind of a workday fashion. So I'm traveling from Tokyo and it's, it's a journey. And so being able to, having more local partners is something which we don't have currently and which would be a boon to the project, being able to like launch work days, get more people to manage the property locally. I'm starting to build that. We are starting to build that capacity. It's a, it's a, it's a process. The other thing I would say is that I'm kind of now at the point with a lot of my different projects and work hats that I'm starting to need to take things away and now kind of having a mentor to kind of strategically walk me through what I need to remove from the daily life in order to be able to incubate and grow this project is something which I could, I need help with. I think the other thing is a, a creative element. So being able to get more music and dance and joy into the land in a visible way. You know, Noji-san, who's been a local supporter of a project and built our sukkah, is a musician. And I'm, you know, with, with COVID, it's been a little bit of touch and go about public gatherings, but it can be done now. So what's the moment where we kind of gather and show our creativity? This has been like a strong message for me. I, I like, I'm a musician. I haven't been playing music that much recently. How do I get a little bit out of the grind and celebrate what we've accomplished to date and celebrate on the land? as opposed to kind of feeling like I got to get the next kind of product in the into production or sort of the next, you know, fabricate the next part, so to speak. So, and then also like the ability to get like very like physicality and kinetic on the land and invite people to do that as well. So like experiencing the land in a very kinetic way to get like strong together and to be outside together, that kind of ties into the work day. So Joe wrote, if you want to change the world, throw better parties. I agree. And Greeks throw parties. You know, Christiana, I learned kind of the word enthusiasm is tied to like knowing God or like, I forget what the origin, in, it's Greek, enthusiastic. Can you tell me a little bit of what enthusiastic means? Enthusiast? Enthusiasmos is to get into another level that connects you exactly with the heart. We Greeks believe that hearts are divine. So it's yoked to the next level. So, and let's say that you see something and you automatically go, wow, this is very good. That's enthusiasm. That's because you allow at this moment to bow and touch the heart. And, and, and this has a name, enthusiasm. And by the way, we did invent Dionysus, we did invent Panas, and tragedy is travon, or the travos is the goat. And Panas is half goat, half god. And he celebrates Dionysus, you see? We invented all this. We throw parties. Now, throw a party that is zero waste, which means it attracts people like us to the musicians in the company. So we are going to be talking again. I was just so going to ask this... Christiana, could you share that video that you shared during the last regeneration pollination that you made in Greece? I think. The team in Kumanashina would love to see that video. It's just exactly the right vibe that we're also looking for in Kumano. Go ahead, Alberto. Welcome. 
Thank you for having me. I wanted to be more in the background and listening. It was very inspiring. But given the turn in the last couple of minutes, I got enthusiastic. And so I wanted to say a few things. Maybe all of you on the call already know about the book, The Gift from Lewis Hyde. It's the first edition is from the late seventies and it half the anthropological treatise and half the literally literal critique. The um, objective of the book is how to give frame of reference for artists on how to be true to their art and at the same time move in the world and make a living of it. And the internal contradiction of the gift that you receive inspiration. And there was the moment, Adam, that I was like, I saw what you, in you saying that there was an inspiration for you that you were drawn to that. And that wasn't a project that you rationally laid down. It was something that was born into you and that you accepted. And then I must say, I am impressed by the incredible amount of labor that you put so that that intuition, that gift could grow into something real. And I didn't want to interject there, although I was inspired, but this last closing on parties and the, the gift uh, that Greek culture gave to the world by <laughs> putting Dionysus squarely at the root of, uh, of some of human expression. The book is relevant, I think, for all regenerative projects, uh, because it explores uh, the relationship that humans had with sharing before we could count and count. So I am guessing, given that you work in industrial automation, I'm an engineer by trade, that we have gone through very rigorous and formal training in to analyzing, breaking down on critiquing and piecing together. And those are very useful tools. But the heart of these projects is about participating in an ecology. Everything that you described isn't about the house. It's about how you see the house as part of an environment, as a part of a community, as a part of the local ecology. And your respect for that was, was really inspiring. Like, I must honestly say that I don't have right now, that kind of commitment and that kind of calling, because I respect too much how much work needs to go into that. So the gift that I'm receiving here is the inspiration of seeing you bring something in the world. And I can only respect that as sacred. It's something that I don't understand. So it's something that I can receive as a gift. It's your art. It's like I'm looking at a piece of art that you are building, that I see you're inspired for, that you have the intuition for, and you have the technique for. And I can understand it and I can only participate by receiving it. I hope to grow into it so that I can bring things like these in the world. I think that's what Nikki meant by being inspired by projects of this kind. Maybe I should stop talking because I can't put the book in five minutes and I wouldn't do a good service to it. But I think that everybody on the call would really be entertained and appreciate and could use as a tool all the little pieces that the book puts together that becomes so relevant to explain the parts that are not, you know, project design, but the underlying anthropology of why these things are so important. Thank you again. Awesome. Some comment. So Andrew, can I just have one minute? First of all, thank you very much. I also just, if it's possible, Miki-san is putting together a very meaningful event in Kamakura later this year. Can we just give him a minute to describe what he's doing with his colleagues as well in Japan? and connect us to it as well. Can you tell us a little bit about your Zen 2.0 this year? I am a founder of Zen 2.0, which is discussing about how the human spirit is important in this artificial intelligent age. So in this year, we are discussing about the impact of artificial intelligence for humanity. The title of our event is Be Like a Water. The title is from Bruce Reed's world in this digital age, the, the rapid change taking place in our world. So if you be like a water, you can be very flexible and we can concern about your environment and, and your mother earth. So I put the link on the chat. So please 
if you have a chance to come to Kamakuro, you can join online too. Thank you to all three of you. So we call this Regenerative Insight Circle. And I'm so impressed because we got insights from all around the room today, not only the presentation, but all the interactions. I want to thank everyone. It was really a fantastic session. And keep going, Adam. Carolina, Miki-san, thank you for sharing your work and let's do it again.